Good afternoon. What we heard this morning was not reasonable then. What we heard were aggressive closing arguments from two uh, very dedicated defense attorneys. But it was not reasonable then. What you heard was a lot of effort to cast aspersions upon a lot of people. Drug use, drug dealing, infidelity, and their past. What you heard was efforts to attack a victim that cannot defend himself. What you heard were suggestions that the real killer is Stephen Martinez. Or maybe the real killer is Mike Robbins. But neither of those guys drove an older model minivan with engine problems. Neither of those guys were seen getting into such a van 30 minutes before the murder. And neither of those guys were identified by the victim as the killer. This case is about a man who said he was going to kill somebody, and then with the help of his cousin, he killed that person. It doesn't matter whether in the street light the van looked like it was gold or silver. It doesn't matter the exact time. It doesn't matter the exact path they took. Michael, excuse me, Dennis Munoz said multiple times to multiple people in multiple forums that he was going to murder Michael Black. And then he did. I'm confident that after your deliberations, you're going to come to that same conclusion. Because the evidence supports it. It's the only conclusion of the evidence. I'm confident in it because Judge Delory is going to share with you the definitions of the law. Not only all the laws and, ch and charges in this case, but specifically reasonable doubt itself. I heard a lot of talk about reasonable doubt this morning, about a, a high burden in this case. And it is a high burden. But sometimes the way the defense attorneys talk about it, you'd think that nobody could ever be convicted of anything. Reasonable doubt is an honest, reasonable uncertainty in your mind. The law does not require proof that overcomes every possible doubt. And if you are firmly convinced that the defendants are guilty, then you must find them guilty. I'm going to take you through as fast as I can. This might be a little bit long. But in order to capture everything, in order to really understand 360 degrees what happened here, we're going to take you through in timeline format. This, this thing isn't recognizing my like from over here. Just if you give me a minute. Timeline's going to start in spring of 2015. Noah is born in February, and Courtney and Wolf split up. Then in the summer of 2015, Courtney and Mike get together in some way, shape, or form. It all seems to start with this Facebook uh, uh, message that Courtney has caught sending to Mike from Wolf's phone. <coughs> That's what starts Wolf suspecting and threatening Mike and Courtney. And there's plenty of options and plenty of instances that you saw through the course of this trial and that you'll have the opportunity to see when you take this evidence back to the jury room. And it all surrounds a consistent topic, which is property. To Wolf, she is his property. Her body is his property. Even though they had split up, even though he had had his infidelities as well, he continued to treat her as though he owned her. Which ultimately leads to a couple of confrontations between Wolf and the victim. 
we have, of course, this text. The one that first drew the investigators to Wolf in the first place. The one where the defendant specifically said that he was going to smoke him, which is consistent with what, with what Keith Wycliffe heard when Mike had him on speakerphone. And Keith told us that he heard the defendant say to Mike, um, you think I'm soft, I'll smoke you. Now, Wolf, trying to cover his tracks a little bit, suggested that smoke can mean anything. To me, smoke means fighting. But we heard otherwise through some other forms of evidence. And we know that they did have this conversation. This conversation, the phone conversation, took place because Wolf himself references it. By the last conversation, the old boy people are far, far away from wanting to die. So Wolf references it. Keith Wycliffe testified to it. And Mike Black tells this woman, Katrina, about it. She asks him, you saw the full context uh, on redirect yesterday. She's asked, she asks him if he's ever been caught, caught cheating, we, we might suppose. He says, did have a dude call my phone like I'm going to kill you, still waiting on it. Well, we know from Dennis's texts, and from Keith's testimony, that that was Wolf telling him that he was going to smoke him a couple months prior. But really, Courtney is the one that gets the brunt of Wolf's aggression for most of the time. Again, it's the idea of property. It's the idea of not being able to let anyone take his place. He's jealous, he's furious, and we all know how he gets over his, again, treating her like she's nothing but property. Somehow, despite texts like that, these two reunite in September of 2015. Not surprisingly, they split apart almost as quickly, and then by October, Wolf is back on the warpath. This, these are October texts. I'll kill over that pity you and everyone else knows. You did it to him. You knew exactly what the F would happen. Even Nux said Coco got old boy in a hell of a position. He got himself there, or you all both uh, helped. And then, of course, I'm going to have to kill him now, you understand. Again, you're going to have the texts, and you're going to have the context for those texts. And so you'll be able to decide for yourself if there is some how some innocent explanation for this text, like uh, Ms. Marquez suggested. <coughs> Talking about old boy here at 946, and then at 950, <coughs> I'm going to have to kill him now. Calling him a lame-ass kufar who thought he was tough, when everyone who knows him knows he's just a worker and a drunk, as if that's something to be ashamed of. So moving through the fall, we have the threats, and then we have Wolf taking Courtney's phone on October 29th. This is from Heather's phone. Wolf just came here, just gave him my phone, everything's deleted and gone, but he says you are done, threatening you again. At a certain point, you have to wonder what the defense is talking about, that this was all some big misunderstanding, and there really wasn't a problem between the defendant and Mike Black. He thinks you live in Cloverleaf. And he knows what kind of car you drive, so maybe hide your truck. He said, you keep thinking I'm a joke and playing me like I'm a joke, you and him. And I'll show you a joke, play me out like you don't know what kind of person I am. <coughs> That's October 29th. By early November, just a few days before the murder, Wolf's mind is made up. November 2nd. Here's my rules. Absolutely no talking taken to old boy at all. For the little bit more, you'll know him for. His mind is made up. This is 1.43 a.m. on the day of the murder. 12, 16 hours before. I'm sorry, babe. I'm not taking this shit much longer. You're my way. So that brings us to the day. 
In the early morning, we know that Mike Black goes to Courtney's home twice, once apparently to buy drugs, and once perhaps for some sort of sexual contact, which Courtney says uh, was not intercourse. And at 3 p.m., Wolf is at Courtney's. How does he get there? Or why, why does he go there? Because of this whole issue about the pills coming up. They had apparently previously had some agreement where Wolf would take some of her pills that she had a prescription for to sell and use. And this day, Courtney decided that she wasn't going to do that anymore. And Dennis is enraged. 234, on the day of the murder, he says, don't play me like that and start me on a war path right now. He was on the war path that day. He heads down from the Egg Harbor City Galloway area, down Route 50 to Mays Landing, hitting off this tower at 247. He's at the house at 3 o'clock, which makes, makes sense. Wolf here, don't text me. This is, from, this is on Mike Black's. By 4 o'clock, he's back up in Egg Harbor City. By 5.40, he's at McDonald's. He's at McDonald's, of course, with the infamous Stephen Martinez. The evidence supports the fact that Stephen Martinez was Wolf's driver from Egg Harbor City down to Mays Landing, where he had that altercation with Courtney at around 3 p.m., and then back to Egg Harbor City, where ultimately they end up at the McDonald's, and Wolf leaves with Edwin in Edwin's van, having coordinated that in those phone calls that we'll see later. Let's look at what infamous Stephen Martinez did on November 9th. From 540 to 552, he was with Wolf at McDonald's. At 552, both of them leave McDonald's. At 621, Wolf calls Stephen. There's a 54 second call from Wolf to Stephen, suggesting pretty clearly that they are not together at that time. 638 to 713, Stephen Martinez is not at Walmart. He's not apparently in that van with Edwin and Wolf. And then, yes, at some point, by 7.09 AM, he's been in Philadelphia for some time. Now, yesterday on, I think it was redirect, if not direct, Lieutenant Finan went through all these things. Today, in closing, it was suggested to you by the defense that uh, the only thing that they went by was this text about being in Philly in the morning. Then, let's look at what Stephen does after the murder. We know sometime before November 16th, he calls Courtney to see kind of what she said, we presume on Wolf's behalf. On November 16th, he has that call with Dennis that, that we heard uh, the other day. And in that call with Dennis, the defendant's own words are crucial. Stephen says something about, oh, don't worry about the phone. Having the phone doesn't mean shots. But Dennis says, Dennis's concern is that they could see the times when he picked me up so they know I'm with him. So Dennis is clearly talking about being concerned about being with some other person, not with Stephen Martinez. He didn't say, I'm worried that they're going to know that we were together. He's talking about with him, some other person. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that Stephen Martinez would have some kind of secondhand information about, about this murder. Um, and he was probably watching the Wycliffs and, and Courtney, their residence downtown, on Wolf's behalf. But still, there's nothing that Stephen could have said that would have changed the fact that Wolf was with Edwin, not Stephen. He was with Edwin before the homicide and at the time of the homicide. We know that Edwin and Wolf are inside that van at 713, passing Walla, heading in the direction of Cloverleaf, where Edwin's van, not Steve's black pickup, was seen. So it's the state's contention that Steve is not evidence that Edwin is not guilty. 
he's evidence that Wolf is guilty of witness tampering. We know from Keith's testimony that he had already been at the house on Farragut and threatened Keith in regards to some other conflict between Wolf and Courtney. We know about the parking outside the house. The defendant, in 2018, sends Keith and Heather, and by extension, Courtney, this. I just want the best for y'all. I don't want the cops to use y'all. Have you look like a-holes. Get released. Then all my gang are looking at y'all. Stephen is the instrument of Wolf's witness tampering. He's that smoking barrel that we see in the letters him threatening Courtney about. Stephen was not at Cloverleaf that night. We know that because Wolf, you might see in the gray sweatshirt there in the passenger side, is in Edwin Velasquez's van leaving McDonald's at 552. Now, Edwin never went in McDonald's at all, which is something that he didn't mention to the investigators when he told them he had been at McDonald's. So he only went there to pick up Wolf. Coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, 552, when this vehicle leaves, is the last communication that Edwin Velasquez's phone makes until it's powered on at 9 p.m. or so later that night. So, they head to Mays Landing. Somewhere between McDonald's and the Walmart, there's a call. There's that call that I mentioned where Wolf calls Stephen. Wolf's phone is somewhere in the Mays Landing area, somewhere between uh, here and Walmart. So they're at Walmart from 738 to 709. We see their car head out the back exit of Walmart and make a left towards Harding Highway. Then the vehicle is seen uh, there it is leaving McDonald's. There it is leaving the Walmart parking lot. There it is passing the Wawa west on Harding Highway. Each time, the distinctive glowing broken tail light can be seen. So, essentially, the defendants have 23 minutes, give or take a minute or two, to get from passing that Wawa and Harding Highway to Cloverleaf. There would have been time to go to Farragut first. Nobody saw them there, but they could have. What we know for sure is that by 7.30, Wolf and Edwin are here, somewhere between downtown and the crime scene. And at 7.30, yes, Wolf does call Allison, who you'll remember, per Courtney, knows where Mike Black lives. She told us that when she testified. Now, uh, counsel for Dennis told us this morning that this call at this time doesn't mean that he was at the crime scene at that moment, which is true, and that it doesn't mean that he was at Farragut at that moment, which is also true. But what it for sure means is that he wasn't sitting home in Galloway minding his own business like he told the police. This order mentioned not for the first time this morning that the CDW, the cell tower location, was not acquired for Edwin Velasquez. And I'll point out, which I think we did a, a few times, that a CDW is useless when a phone does not make any communications. And Edwin's phone makes zero communications between 5.52 and 9 or so p.m. So, 7.30 p.m. on the day of the murder. Wolf had been threatening to kill Mike Black for months. He'd been threatening Courtney for months. So why now? Why today? Well, we know that Wolf can see Courtney's texts and phone communication. And so early in the morning, texts and calls between Mike and Courtney. He contacts her to try to arrange this situation about the court date and about the pills, and she says no. He 
anymore. They don't start a war. He goes down there. They fight. They have this altercation. He goes back up, calls Edwin, and arranges his ride back to his land. As this is going, if he's looking, he can see more and more interactions between Courtney's phone number and Mike's phone. She's not going to help him anymore. She doesn't need him anymore. She doesn't want him anymore. There's another man that she's letting touch. She's letting him touch her. His property is not his property anymore. And on top of that, his pills, or her pills, are not his pills anymore. 